We've got a hi from Shiro and it's 302 or 202. And I think I'll begin. I'll begin by welcoming everyone to the poetry of possibilities, speculative poetry reading. And my name is Akua Leslie Hope. And for some reason I can't see myself. So pardon me while I putz around and make sure I'm visible. Um, I greet you from the ancestral land of the Onondaga, also known as the Seneca, keepers of the Western Door in the area currently called the Southern Finger Lakes region of New York State. We're here, it's 3.03 p.m. and chilly. I pay respect to the Seneca people, past, present, and future. I learned about doing land acknowledgement earlier this year at another convention to which I'm very grateful, Con Zealand. And it opened my mind so that I could be resonant with the dismantling of our colonialist amnesia. I was very moved by what the folks in New Zealand did. I offer gratitude to those who have gone before by whose courage and resilience I was created and am sustained. I'm real grateful to be here at CIMACON with these other wonderful speculative poets. And the first one reading today is Bryant O'Hara. Bryant O'Hara is a programmer, poet, and musician, and not always in that order and sometimes all at once. His debut poetry collection, The Ghetto Birds, will be published by Frayed Edge Press in spring 2021. Bryant lives in Stone Mountain, Georgia with his wife, Alice, two out of seven children and one out of five grandchildren. And he's got links in chat for you to hear some of his other poetry and sound pieces. Welcome, Bryant. Hello, everybody. Uh, so I guess I'll be starting off today and this, um, we'll just jump right into it. This first piece is called Bad Mother. Nature is a bad mother, half raising one bastard species after another dropping them into an ongoing explosion saying, make your way after sashaying down the eons to drop off a load of kids. These children of the deoxyribonucleic constantly get themselves into a whole mosaic of devilment, more often because they were in the right place that became the wrong place at nature's hard luck dice roll. And there's always a group of these hellions, sometimes just one, that manages to really foul the nest. From the first anaerobic bacterium that messed up the atmosphere, farting out oxygen to that whippersnapper humankind, some of them really get themselves in a bind. And you know what Mama Nature always says? You fix it or you buy it. I ain't got time for your bullshit. After sashaying down the eons to drop off a load of kids. A lot of them do buy it or jerry build an adaptation, but humankind, oh no. This little knucklehead actually has the indignation to talk back to its mama like it's grown. Get up in her face and raise its voice at her, saying, I'll fix it and I'll break this world to do it if I have to. And then I'm getting off this rock because I got other places to be than under a couple of meters of deep blue sea because I ain't got time for your bullshit. And nature, bad mother that she is, looks humankind in its collective eyes and says, I dare you. So the next piece is the children of the woods. I watched my great great grandchildren sink into the earth and I cried and I cried and I cried. I watched my great great grandchildren smiling and leaning to the left as they descended into the biotechno microsphere, the gray and the green and the gooey of the newly networked earth, 
And I cried and I cried and I cried. I cannot go with you. I don't have the filaments. I cannot understand. They sent me a text message, ancient and quaint, saying, don't cry, Poppy. We are alive, oh, so alive, growing and wading deep, deep down into fungi town. There is work to do here, deep, deep down in fungi town. And we would take you too, deep, deep down into fungi town. You cannot go. You know this, right, Poppy? It is not meant to be. I know this. I text back, my thumbs ache, my joints crack. I don't have the filaments. I can only see the wake of their movements, translated by software two generations younger than me that I barely understand or I cannot understand. Perhaps someday I may when my flesh decays or my metal winds down. Won't you take me, I ask, down to Fungi Town? Sorry, Poppy, you're not fungi enough. What's left of them coughs up spores as they laugh. I chuckle as I cough. Put your mask on, Poppy. I speak to their sinking bodies. What are you doing down there? What are you building? Are you eating? Are you being eaten? What are you? More spores and then the text. You wouldn't believe us if we told you. Put your mask on, Poppy. You can't take much more of this. Watch your text, Poppy. We'll see you. We will. Not soon, but you will see us. We will. Until then, Poppy, live longer. You will see us. Live longer. I watered my great-great-grandchildren when they sank into the earth, and I cried, and I cried, and I cried. Not because they had died, but out of pride. Someday, something, some amazing, familiar, and oh, please, beautiful thing will grow there. I know this. I know this. I know this. And I got one last poem. Cornelius of the Rock. You hear the howl before you hear the hum, before you hear the huff, before you hear the hush. That is the Cornelius, the fantastic, phantasmic bank head line, sliding into the station on a Gaussian groove. The doors of the last three cars, the bank head line, are never open. Those last three cars are always dark, always in use, always inviting a quick sidewise glance. No one may enter them except from the inside. No one you know knows who will go to the back. They always pack a bag the size of a kindergartner's. They clutch each bag so tightly, like a lost childhood toy. They empty wallets of change if they are wealthy, cell phones if they are chatty, spirits if they believe in such things. The disconnection is a ceremony each invents while making their way to the back. The fourth car from the last is the loudest, full of revelers and drunkards, street preachers and scientists. As the Cornelius makes its way to its momentary terminus, a chant rises from end to oh so coveted end. Cornelius of the Rock, the Rock, Soul Train, Stone Carver, Cornelius of the Rock, the Rock, Wandering Mind of the Tunnel Boring Whirly Worm, Cornelius of the Rock, the Rock, Maker of Ways Out of Walls. Take us to the line, take us to the line, Take us to the end of the end of the line. They all want a glimpse of the momentary terminus, and they will never get it. The spores from the third dark car sing to them and bring to them a fuzzy, out-of-focus frenzy, a buzz and then an ecstasy. And from that daze, there is a phase change and then the hymn. How, hum, huff, and hush, Cornelius, seeing us the future, luscious, how, hum, Huff and hush, Cornelius season us, the dangerous, the precious, the how, hum, huff and hush, Cornelius freeing us, the luscious future. The door to the third dark car slides open. There is a blank moment. The door shuts. A pastel blue bike stands with tempera blue rims, missing its rider. A tablet, screen down toward a subscriber, a rattle, minus a child. 
The mother and the father wail and then howl. And the soul train howls back long and loud. As the howl decays into the hum, pops into the huff, and falls into the hush. The giggle, hidden in the hush, does a little rise and does a little fall. The doors open. Last stop before the lost stop. The momentary terminus. All passengers must leave the soul train. The remnants of the missing are left on board. These things are not lost, and the Cornelius wastes nothing. And the owners may, may, maybe in some other way, but that is not for us to say. Thank you. Thank you, Bryant. Bravo. Thank you so much. I'm up next, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm a creator and wisdom seeker who uses sound, words, fiberglass, metal, and wire to create poems, patterns, stories, music, sculpture, adornments, and peace whenever possible. My honors include the Science Fiction and Fantasy Poetry Association Short Poem Award, the National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship, to New York Foundation of the Arts Fellowships, Riesling, and Pushcart Prize nominations, among others. I wrote my first speculative poems when I was in the sixth grade, so I've been loving this genre for a long time. A Cave Canem Fellow, I've been published in many, new, many literary magazines and anthologies since uh, before you were born in 1974. My first collection, Ambassure Poems on Jazz and Other Musics, won the Writer's Digest Book Award, and my newest collection, Them Gone, was published in 2018. I'm an avid hand paper maker and crochet designer, and I won't get to read this poem today because it will take too long, but this is one of my crochet designs. I love dragons, everybody. A paraplegic, I founded a paratransit nonprofit to provide transportation in my area. I sing songs to my favorite anime in Japanese, practice my soprano saxophone, and I try to make a good manifest. I had a chat with uh, one of your organizers, and I'm reading this poem, dedicating this to Simokan. It's called Smallville. We talked about both the show and a bit about the person who grew up in Smallville, Superman, Smallville. At last he flies, no longer blurred, another era ends. Revisioned icon emerges, sharply costumed, cast threatening darkness out, saves us, lingering, long embrace as each player says goodbye to all past fiction, but now part of the myths we make of myths, a past sheared across miles and electrons, faces we came to expect weekly, voices we wanted to hear, hold, and now this ends. Boys become men, join girls, already women who fought, wept, waited, lost their loves and lives to wars and monsters. He speeds to the sun dappled rooftop, rips his shirt open <laughs> to reveal another self. And we watchers are ever the child in bed asking to hear this alien story told again and again. This next poem is to another wonderful show, um, Star Trek, the original. And my whole family would pile up on the couch and be on top of each other and watch this in black and white a million years ago. This is Dead Ensign. How much can he cry? This time he got to be the guy perishing for the cause, moving the plot along, represented in sleek caskets, jettisoned like flesh to fill empty space, a better lot than the green harlot marked by her improbable hue, 
cast aside for her self-assertion, unmasked, on cue, no praise from the betrayed captain and none from the remaining crew, grateful for another episode to be among the surviving few, dead ensign. I noticed that Simokan was focused on anime, so I thought I'd read one of my anime poems. This was in uh, the Mythopoesis issue of Eye to the Telescope, and it's called Noragami. If you haven't seen it, please check out this very moving layered anime. Noragami means stray god. Stray god peddles his favors. Five yen coins are all he charges in an effort to make a memory that will not be dislodged. A living from the living made by hitching to your errant heart. Some healing or relieving pleasure connections to remain. Fish hook in supplicant's brain. Born as all those lowercase gods from the polyphony of needs, choirs of desires, each chord struck manifestation, a synthesis of longings, energy, sprouts rogue and regal avatars. Girl doesn't know the danger of this unnamed love. Hobo may abscond with a peck of joy, run away, jump the rails, fly to a halfway heaven cross to far shore. He's a wayward Peter Pan, a warped teen dream, this minor god of war and calamity, an irritating reminder of past times, lost worlds, ever heedless of the yearning he stirs, the risks that flow in the wake of his worship, friendship, He'll never meet the daily diligence of mortal adolescent life, nor make a good buddy despite his transcendent good looks, his dark joie de vivre, magic flights of fancy, his ability to get wet, stay dry, breathe underwater, and never die unless polluted by unchecked passions of his ensouled regalia, shaped shifting weaponry of our deceased with dues to pay. Malingering blues, yoked wanderers, tripping boys, God boys, sipping from her full moon bowl, Noragami. And my last poem, Dogon. Please look up these people, these marvelous people in Africa who knew things before Western science knew them. Dogon. Even before the spit assessment, I knew ancestry said there was Molly in me. My nomo stool had frightened a visiting preacher. Circle of many next to the ancestral couple, stoic, seated together, holding a point open for connection atop the cedar cupboard containing old percussive toys, glass xylophones, goatskin rattles, iron bells, reed flutes, kalimba, instruments of soft summonings that had calloused my thumbs, exacting a toll for expertise, or set an echoing stir within, urging me to play on. As the point held by the carvings widened into a star-pierced darkness, a remembered scent of warmed earth and sighing grasses purpled and gilded the low-figured stone escarpments. Sounds came from me, some unknown remembrance calling, singing into space, humming, homing, clicking and chirping, snips of something like song as again an imagined window widened became a dilating door that I stepped through. Dogon. Thank you for listening.
And our next poet is She's named here as the Bohemian poet, but she's Linda Ann Loshavo. It's native New Yorker, Linda Ann Loshavo is a freelance journalist, dramatist, and formalist. In May 2020, she was Poetry Superhighway's Poet of the Week. Her speculative poetry has been published in many journals and anthologies. She has a YouTube channel for sci-fi fantasy horror video poems, and I've watched a couple of them. Please check it out. Her sci-fi fantasy fiction has earned two silver honorable mentions from writers of the future. Her poetry chapbooks are Conflicted Excitement and Concupiscent Consumption. Her full-length collection, A Root Obscure and Lonely, has been nominated for an Elgin Elgin Award, which is being judged right now, so good luck. A lifetime member of the Dramatist Guild of America, her plays include Counting, Courting Mae West, sorry, and Diamond Lil, Queen of the Bowery. She's completed two documentary films on Mary Louise Texas Guinan. Linda Ann is part of the team of Poet Magazine and is the editor of the English language section of Ridea Magazine. Welcome, Bohemian poet, also known as Linda Ann. Yes. Hello, everybody. All of the poems I'm going to read today are from my latest collection, A Route Obscure and Lonely. I'll start with my two sci-fi poems. One is called Rendezvous in the Forest. A woman hunting for mushrooms has a strange encounter. Night's canopy dares me to steal away, rebellious, jumping that forbidden fence to gather prized morels, their strong, distinct intensity appealing, curious excursions undertaken secretly. Morcella have a symbiotic relationship with trees, though unalike, attachments that help growing things survive. An alien has been observing me. Where did you come from? What made me unafraid? You plucked me from earth, softening my limbs in chemical light. I became your mate, lit from within, like mushrooms that can glow in darkness, with bioluminescence, strange befitting me, the beams igniting flesh. Your knot hands cup each curve, warm, tenderly, with extraordinary skill. Hoist me to knot lips that emit erotic sounds, transporting me to heights I've only dreamed about till now. My skin looks new, but pruned. Was this your planet's purification, my intergalactic suave gigolo? One moment floating through thin air together, wrapped in knot arms. We've escaped through time and space, strong currents pulling me along, but then you vanished utterly. My knees kissed forest soil and fingertips away, green glowing fungi grow as if predestined. Just a dream, a fantasy, I think, except my thumb cap's been tattooed, gold runes encircling it like a ring. This next poem, Presentism Core, is set in a dystopian universe where media is controlled and a tyrant rules the realm. Today, Bice began raving, mentioning Jean Tierney, how Clark Gable had to save her from the Russians. None of it made sense. No one had heard of Hollywood noir films. We watched approved demons, like everyone. No point in choosing, since it came to you, selected, tabulated. And why think about the pirated alternatives? She starred in one with Dana Andrews, where they thought she had been killed, and she turns up. Her madness and out-talking ought to be reported to the presentism corps. They'd handle it. Bice would be disappeared, but she was family, 
and blood's cocoon protects us from outside interference. It's Jean! I feel her astral presence here! She's beckoning us to a brighter sphere, mists spitting in her face like pissed off ghosts. All of the ghost poems in my book are mostly based on real encounters. This is a ghost, a voice ghost, that came to me when I was nursing my dying mother at my parents' home in Florida, house guest. With measured strokes, I brush defiant hair, cascading waves that cancer left untouched. You'd had enough of hospitals, that lack of privacy, imagining your home serene, secure, free from intrusive pests. It would shock you to learn we're not alone. At dawn, the presence by the sills crispens, emerges as the drapes inhale into a phantom shape. Infernal company, omniscient brakeman, timer in cold hands, poised, waiting, exhalations nearly through. Lost in the territory of morphine, deciding to eject your breathing tubes, you tossed away the life-saving device. Asleep, I'm unaware, till ghost commands rouse me full awake. There's no choice but to go rescue you, reconnect the air. Long shadows darken the stairs, that peekaboo behind the hooded cloak. I startle you, attaching oxygen speed properly removing you tonight from danger's ledge. A grimace rises from the bedding's edge as if to say, not now, I'll tell you when. There's so many unhappy wives who are reported missing. Scott Peterson's wife, Lacey Peterson and others. And sometimes they return to the home they knew where they were abused and they haunt it. This is one of those poems, Footprints in the Snow. It's the same dream that wakes me up each time. Could it be some ghost family returned? Asleep, strange shards of memory poke me like spikes. The walls are melancholy now since she slipped out that winter, calloused feet shoeless, although it snowed for hours. Chills came creeping into corners by the stove and stood behind me when I held a knife. My neighbor said police check mental wards, all accident reports, and combed the woods. They found no trace. Her husband sold the house. Neglected properties need TLC, attract those good caretaking. It's strange, quiet arrives in sudden blasts of cold, announcing it resists all ownership. I don't recognize my own fireplace. Who cut this cord of wood? Left embers, ashes inside the pit. When I bend to smooth sheets, I sense cool whispering. The window shines, reveals it's snow tonight, and left fresh prints, small, delicate. The person was barefoot. I'm afraid to be responsible, afraid to be asked questions. Please, stay away. My final poem is a 10 line poem. Everybody who knows the theater knows that every theater has a ghost in it. This is called The Ghost Light Knows. How ignominious to die on stage, but drama's rule book states shows must go on. Most thespians career flash fade upstaged by fresher fame. Obscurity looms, dooms, but restless souls of actors, ham or star alike, are known to haunt old dressing rooms, become sly backstage spies. Thus all theaters install the ghost life. Superstitions hack. Where else do actors feel at home? Ghost lights greet those old marquee names blinking. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda Ann. 
Oh, you gave me chills and it's already chilly up here. Um, <laughs> I, I've, I've enjoyed reading and learning your work and, and meeting you. Thank you for being Thank here. You. Thank you. Our, our next poet, now she's got to forgive me because she just instructed me how to say her name, but I've been saying it another way in my head. So pipe up, Cherie. Cherie. So yes, Cherie Renee Thomas. Cherie, so Cherie, <laughs> but okay. So what had I said? I, I don't know what I said wrong before. Cherie. All right. I said Cherry. Cherry, Cherie, it's all. No, like no, 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 Cherie. Oh, Cherie, Cherie, I got it. I got it, so I'm safe. Good, good. Cherie <laughs> Renee, I mean, like it's spelled too, okay? Yeah. So, <laughs> it's always astonishing. <laughs> like it's Cherie. spelled. Yes. <laughs> Cherie, Cherie Renee Thomas, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm going to take a moment to say I am so proud and gratified that this human exists in the world. Um, she's doubtless, you know, family and other people have other reasons to, to cherish her, but I cherish her in particular for, uh, we'll get to that. Uh, let me read her bio. Cherie Renee Thomas is an award-winning fiction writer, poet, and editor. Her role as an editor. Her work is inspired by myth and folklore, natural science, and Mississippi Delta Conjure. Mm. <laughs> Nine Bar Blues, Stories from an Ancient Future is her fiction debut. Bravo. She's also the author of two multi-genre hybrid collections, Sleeping Under the Tree of Life, Thank you, long listed for the 2016 Otherwise Award and honored with the publisher's weekly starred review, congratulations, and Shotgun Lullabies. She edited the world fantasy winning groundbreaking black speculative fiction anthologies, the first dark matter, this is why I love her, and is the first to introduce W.E.B. Du Bois's science fiction short stories. Her work is widely anthologized. Akave Kahnem Fellow, me too, her essays appear in the New York Times and other publications. She's the associate editor of the historic Black Arts Literary Journal, Obsidian, which I also love. She was recently honored as a 2020 World Fantasy Award finalist in the Special Award Professional Category for Contributions to the Genre. And she's got links in chat so you can check her out some more. Welcome, Cherie. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you. Made me feel special today, dear. Oh, good. <laughs> All right. It's wonderful to have an opportunity to read poetry. Um, um, love my poetry community, and thank you so much for doing this work for us, all this labor. We appreciate you. Thank you. So I'm going to read um, a few poems. Right. Forgive me. Just want to scurry along here. All right, so I can see. <laughs> Eartha Kid reflects on Catwoman. Some men always wanted to lay me down, but he never stayed to pick me up again. So I learned to make fear of my friend, made a temple of bone, my mind, hard back pews, regret the ceiling of my skull. I scaled the night, my mouth full of the cathedral sky. I spoke in tongues, back arch and leather shine, blood claw and tooth divine. I wrapped my tail around the throat of desire. Many tried to hollow my spirit, usher their hungers into the bowl of my brain, spilling their need like bloodstained wine against the fabric of my full altar, but I refused their offerings. Still, when the moon shimmer cast her spell over the city's devilish light, I walk back through the shadowed walls of reverie, scrape and scratch the old wounds and purr, 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 just to hear myself remember and bleed. Changeling. To reach into the sea of a small brown hen, to see the moon swim in the black mirror of river, child of mandrake, seed of yellow gourd, crystal of white snow. I hold you in my arms, the last figment of an em embryonic dream, where the tides rush backwards and water is pooled by the ancient scales of memory. 
I scavenge the forest floor for bloody roots and endless nuts, dance round a ring of burning redwoods in search of a widening place from which to enter this world or the next, a realm where we can lay the burden down, exchange one pain for another's joy, for doubts to draw themselves into the curled shells of shears, where bad memories melt into the icy lakes of swift waters, the wintry sum of all our tears. This is from Botanica. I sing the earth and four movements. This was commissioned um, by Smith College. So the first section is called Fistrin, a calling. She woke 93 miles, 93 million miles from herself, and silence did not hold her tongue. Shoulders rising from darkened waters, her voice rang out on the skin of air. She began with lovers, two on the swept floor of earth. She was what passed between them. She was what breathed inside them. She was a sweet gourd, too heavy for the vine and full of her own wet seed. Grandmama God kept the red trick bad, the blood stained cloth that held her neighbor's string, so she would not forget the other women she lived inside before time was ruined. So she would not forget the other lives that lived inside the river before its waters were ruined. Daughter of Nan, the first sister walked the muddy river's banks and listened, each soul whispering her name. Her name was the beginning of hunger. Her name was the curiosity they called sin. Desire was in that jackball bag of ribs and bones and want, the origins of betrayal. But there was forgiveness too. The dry seeds of the serpent's rattle that could shake loose a killing, shake away a healing. She stood naked and painted herself haint blue, color of the old ways, a blue hand across a blue black face, seven axes in the circle of sun. She danced counterclockwise in the ceremony of wayward daughters and the ritual of those who must birth themselves again and again. She danced a river of sighs, the dance to call the spirits up, the ones wrapped in night's black skin, the ones whose palms rise to the stars, the lifelines wrapped all around their race. Her spirit disappeared inside its dance. She is the wild one that lives in the palm of the river. She is the marigold in winter, the black dahlia of a hard frost spring. She is the wild one, the dandelion that wants to fly away from herself. She is the wild one who fights to be her one true authentic self. At night she drowns and wakes her painted blue skin beneath the water. Her blue palms reach for me. I know the taste of her. Her hands reach through time and find the bare earth of me. I say her names, earth calling water. She is my mother. She is my daughter. She is your mother. She is your daughter. No mother, no daughter. She came from a womb. She has no womb. She is all of us and she is none of us. She is the swept earth calling the river sister. She is the one who whispers sis. She is the one who says resist. She is the one who will always persist. She is the one. She is the flow. Thank you. Mm, mm, mm. Bravo. Mm, mm. Oh, those who birth themselves again and again. Oh, telling us to resist. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, this has been so wonderful to be in the company of all of you. And this next reader has extended the hand of friendship and insight to me. I'm so delighted that she's here with us from the West Coast. Wendy Van Camp is the creator behind No Wasted Ink, a blog about the craft of writing that features author interviews, sci-fi and fantasy book reviews, and poetry. Her short stories and poems have appeared in Lit Up, Sci-Fi Quest, Quantum Visions and Far Horizons. She's published The Curate's Brother, a Jane Austen variation of Persuasion, a Regency historical novel. So like Cherie, you, all, all you multi-genre people love it. And The Planets, a sci-fi poetry collection. A graduate of the James Gunn Speculative Fiction Workshop, Wendy has won honorable mention at the Writers of the Future contest and has been nominated for an Elgin Award. 
She makes her home, good luck, Wendy. She makes her home in Southern California with her husband and mischievous cat who I caught a peek of. He's my favorite color. He's ginger and beautiful. She enjoys travel, urban sketching, and jewelry making. And I hopefully she posted her link at No Wasted Ink. Thank you and welcome, Wendy. Oh, uh, thank you, Akua. I'm gonna start the timer for myself. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just get started with this. Excuse me while I take my glasses off. My eyes are horrible. And I'm doing this the old fashioned way off of paper. Uh, my first poem it was originally published in a magazine called Lit Up back in 2018. And it was inspired by um, the Star Wars Clone Wars series. It's called He Is Your Brother. I do not wear chains, but I am a slave, born in factory, fathered by science, trained to be a fighter in human wars. I am declared the ultimate soldier. My sergeant says, look right, then to the left. Each face is an exact copy of my own. We are the same height, same build, the same soul. Treat him well, for he is your brother. As my brothers die around me, I wonder if this is all there is. I do my duty fighting in another war. We move in formation under the hot sun. Do I stand with my brothers and fight, or do I fight alone? For our freedom. The next poem is called Cassandra. It was also published in Lit Up back in uh, 2018. And uh, it was actually inspired by an ABBA song, believe it or not. Cassandra. In the morning your ship will be sailing, prepared by your father to whisk you safe. Watch the Silicon City understanding as the people flee the enemy in haste. Now that the last bloody day is dawning, you suffer your secrets within your heart, for none would listen to words of warning. Oh, Cassandra, it's time to depart. Into the fair skies you rocket up, away from the death you have foreseen. In orbit, solar sails prepare to cup, waves of photon energy by machine. Sorry, Cassandra, we did not believe. We only saw it as drawn as dreams you would weave. And that's that one. The next one I wanted to read is a recent publication in a magazine called uh, The Starlight Emporium. Um, actually, the editor had contacted me because she wanted a poem to commemorate the recent SpaceX launch. She gave me a week deadline. I met it with a day to spare. Uh, and this is the result of that. It's a, a three-part poem. The first part is called Apollo. At dawn, the monolith rises with brave men to ascend the heavens. We will journey to the moon. The nation holds its collective breath as television cameras spy. At dawn, the monolith rises with brave men to ascend the heavens. On magnificent blossoms of fire, Kennedy's dream comes to life. We see our world with new eyes. At dawn, the monolith rises with brave men to ascend the heavens. We will journey to the moon. Part two is called Endeavor. Over and over the flying brick transports humans into orbit, landing home after her mission. When the Challenger explodes, we grow fearful of outer space. Over and over, the flying brick transports humans into orbit. Astronauts float in the space station, performing great experiments the earthbound do not comprehend. Over and over, the flying brick transports humans into orbit, landing home after her mission. And the final part is called Dragon. The rising dragon is a javelin with precision pierces the sky, leaping forth from pad 39A. Despite masks and social distance, the nation relives Apollo mystique. The rising dragon is a javelin with precision pierces the sky. Former shuttle pilots rename SpaceX craft their endeavor. 
bringing the past into the future. The rising dragon is a javelin with precision pierces the sky, leaping forth from pad 39A. And finally, I'm going to end with a couple of sci-fi clue from my um, book, The Planets, which is right here, again, nominated for a Elgin Award. And uh, sci-fi coup are, of course, science fiction themed haiku, for those that don't know. So they go pretty quickly. First one I call Mercury. I circle the sun in spin orbit resonance, lonely messenger. The next one is Venus impact. Sulfuric air of Venus burns meteors of certain size. Small rocks need not apply. The next one is called dysphoria. Life springs from the earth. Humans are as seeds on the wind, colonizing worlds. Next one I call Mars. This elderly world, lost global magnetic field, can't hold its breath. Next one I call canals. Mistaken translation, Italian Canelli creates hope. Of Martian life. And I have one about the moon of Titan. Your deep canyons hold rivers of hydrocarbons where we plant our flag. Next one is called Encephalus geysers. Hot geysers take aim at Saturn's magnetosphere, mingle and merge. Next one I call Uranus breath. In monotonous teal, methane hides soul of giant, wild winds storm beneath. And the final one of this series is called Planted, uh, Planet Pluto. In the Coupier belt, dwarves mingle with comets. Size doesn't matter. And that's the last of them. Thank you very much. Oh, bravo, bravo. Oh, are all the poets unmuted? Because yes. let's make sure. Bryant, Bryant. Right. Okay, there I, we I go. Unmute. We're we're all here together. Thank you, everyone, for being here. This is it's such a singular treat for me, for the shared engagement in this area of creation. It's just incredibly heady for me, very affirming for me, and, and thrilling because there are so many, listen, everybody touched me and reminded me of similar poems that I ventured on. You know, uh, Cassandra, I was just like, I've got a Cassandra poem too, that ghost poem. I just got through writing about, you know, hearing my parents' voices. Um, you, everyone's evoked things for me, so thank you so much. I'm asking the audience now if there are any questions, but if not, I, I have uh, things that I'd love everyone to just, you know, chat in on now that we can all talk together. Um, I've been making these enormous lists, as Bryant has seen in particular, of all the genres included under the, under the umbrella of speculative poetry. And so I put this question, till I wait to hear from the audience to everyone, to just talk about what particular part of speculative poetry do you find most resonant? And just go ahead. Well, for me, can, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> Technology. Okay. Uh, for me, the reason I started writing speculative poetry is because of all my ghost encounters. And I've had them for a very long time. Uh, I grew up in an unusual family. My mother and father spoke every day when he was at work without a phone, every day without a phone. And I, um, that was my family. So I thought everybody could do this, and, but I didn't know how. And when I was 11 years- So what, 
quick question. So when you say this, I just want to be clear. So they were telepathic? Yes. Okay. My entire family is. I can speak to them without phones. Anyway, um, so when I was 11, my parents got me my first personal phonograph. And I was playing it one Sunday, and it went on fire. So my father had to take it back to the service center on the weekend on his day off. And we lived in New York City. He had to drive it to New Jersey. And this was like a big, big, big deal. So my father pulls out the car with the phonograph. And we realize that he's left all the paperwork on the table. The receipt, the instructions, just everything. And my mother yells to me, call daddy, tell him to come home. And that was my first experience where I just spoke to my father and 10 minutes later, he was back in front of the house. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Right? I love that. That's great. That's great. Did the oh, telepathy no extend no beyond the family? <laughs> <laughs> did you hear me, Linda Ann? Did your telepathy oh. extend beyond the family? Uh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. I um, have experienced uh, strong connections. I was taking my master's degree comps, and I was supposed to meet a new boyfriend at Port Authority. And they decided that they would cancel the lunch. So I was going to actually be finished two hours early and wait by Port Authority with my skis for no reason. And he was a sanitary engineer for New York City, worked in the field, had no phone, went into the bathroom and spoke to daddy. <laughs> and he was right on time at Port Authority. Woo! It's hap it happened other times too. It's really, it's really quite magical. I wrote a story about, about getting lost in a storm on a highway and I was supposed to be following a car and I couldn't find the car anymore because it was just one of these theatrical storms. So I pulled off to the side and I asked the car, where are you? And I found the car. This is the days before cell phones, days before car phones. Very, very, very convenient. Uh, a lot of times people speak to me. Sometimes people who are dead, they want favors and so forth. And um, all my life, I've had these experiences and only decided to write about them after establishing myself as a credible writer. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be thought of as a ghost and so forth. Uh, it's really, it's really quite interesting because I will read cards, not where I get paid, but for uh, benefits, fundraisers, where they collect the money. And I have to really keep a straight face because as the people are walking toward me, I already know the question. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have a, a vignette to tell you. I'm I'm not telepathic, but I was the youngest member of the American Society for Psychical Research mm. back in the 60s. And I would travel from Queens to Manhattan to participate in experiments of long distance. <laughs> transmission and I so wish that it had that my skill extended to telepathy so I was I was a pretty good long distance sender I had a friend around the corner who I would take with me this is from Queens and so we we take the bus to the train etc go to Manhattan and and do um, these experiments until they figured out they would send some to us at home and just give us appointed times and dates. So I don't. I, I mentioned that because I know you're you're in Manhattan, and I wondered if you'd ever connected with the American Society for Psychical Research. It has a, had a beautiful building. I, I'll I'll look it up. I'll tell you more offline. But um, but let's hear from some other folks. What aspect of speculative poetry, the big umbrella, do you most relate to? Um, I'll just say. Cherie, tell us. 
Um, I love I love, love more the fantasy mythology part of it. Mm. Um, um, it's where I find stuff. So this conversation is very very intriguing to me. Not the ghosts are necessarily fantasy or anything, but it's just like that's the elements, the magical part of the it. magic, yeah, the magic of it. Um, I enjoy. Um, I have written science fiction poems, um, but I, it almost feels like a, um, cerebral. And so one of the things I'm um, I'm hoping to do with my practice is to bring the type of freedom and joy that I have in my poetry that I write that is fantasy work to the science fiction work as well, which is, I feel like, you know, when you talk mm -hmm. to scientists in the, in the few times I've been, you know, had the great good fortune to be able to meet someone who <laughs> that's their work and they tell you like the tedium of their, of their craft, like it's a lot of waiting and watching. Yes. And as one um, scientist told me, um, he was working on a very significant project that was international. Um, and he said it was the one he never dreamed that he would work on a project that he would see it executed in his lifetime. Oh. You know? um, and that, that really hit me that, mm -hmm. that being a scientist is a lot of waiting and watching and, and faith and, and having faith. And aware, aware. And yeah. 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 So I want to bring that sense of joy and discovery because they do have that sense of joy and discovery as well into the science. But yeah. Thank you. Bryant. Well, I think the the aspects that I kind of try to aim for leans more towards um, uh, science and hard science uh, <laughs> fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, uh, I'm a child of the, the big folks like Asimov and mm -hmm. Clark mm -hmm. and even some of the, the newer folks like David Brin and, and uh, Greg Bear. Mm. Uh, and I guess what I try to evoke in the, in the poems I write is uh, a sense of awe and wonder at both the natural world and uh, the artificial one that we create because there are aspects of that, of, of both worlds, that if you kind of pay attention, um, have these, these uh, essences of wonder. I mean, even if you take a look at a train system, like, I mean, I, I live in it, I live near Atlanta, Georgia, so I take MARTA, which is the uh, a public transit system. And so for something that may seem as mundane as that, you start noticing things like, okay, well, there's, there's all these rats and pigeons and cockroaches and stuff like that. And there's this whole <laughs> ecosystem that's going on in parallel with all these different mechanical systems that are, uh, that are also taking place to make sure that the trains run. Run, yes. On. And by mixing those two things and, and adding those elements of wonder uh, and occasionally the absurd, <laughs> uh, you, you can get something, uh, you can get something out of it. And that's kind of what I kind of hope to do with these poems. Okay. Yes. Wendy. Well, I, I think it's probably clear that most of my inspiration comes from science. I've been a huge follower of the space program. Mm. So I, I saw the, the moon landing with Neil Armstrong live. And it, but it was at a very young age. I think I was like four years old at the time. It, it made such an impact on me. I think it really has carried over throughout my life. Um, I love the space program. Um, yes. I taught chemistry for a while in high school. I did mathematics. But I think as... Uh, you sure. taught chemistry oh or organic was my weakness i'm a certified gemologist too so i love stones but I, I approach it more from the scientific aspect then but you know i have a little the psychic myself what can i say yeah me it's been more the science and i i do write fantasy too not as much as the sci-fi but the funny thing is I started out more as a fantasy writer, tapping more into emotions and all that. Um, but as I've gotten older, I've shifted more into science fiction. So I do a little of both. And, you know, we just do whatever inspires us. As you can tell, I also take from uh, mythology and, and other sources, too. Um, it's just kind of whatever, uh, whatever strikes your fancy at the time. I, that's one thing I love about poetry. It's very immediate. Yes. You get an idea, you could just pop it down on paper and do it. it. It's out there very quickly if you want to, whether it's when you work on your short stories and novels. Those are projects that take an incredible amount of time, and you have to be a little more dedicated to that particular idea. 
um, what is it, poetry, you can just go crazy and do whatever you want. And, you know, it's an afternoon, two afternoons at best. <laughs> maybe just do that. Well, at least for me. I, maybe they just come out. So it's it's I'm I'm lucky when it's an afternoon or two. Sometimes it's oh, like wow. it, sometimes it's years. Sometimes it's years. You know. Well, yes. I, I write sci-fi too. That's my specialty, and you know there are three lines. So yeah, an afternoon. Usually I can do about five or six of them in an afternoon. <laughs> but that's a little yeah, you know, a longer poem. Yeah, it does take a little bit longer. But I I like to just write poetry when I'm inspired. And usually it's, since I'm reading so many um, scientific journals, mm. you write science fiction stories, um, a lot of times those will just creep into my poetry as well. But, you know, it's whatever inspires us. So whatever interests you, it becomes your poetry. And like you were saying, Akira, I mean, the, the spectrum of the speculative fiction is so wide, you can draw from so many sources. It's, yes. it's really, that's one more thing I love about it. It's you the joy of it. Go from almost any direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on that note, I'm going to thank Sima Khan for hosting us mm -hmm. and thank all of the poets for participating, for sharing their art, their work, their heart, their time. It's been a wonderful experience for me, I hope for you, and hope to see you all very, very soon. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.